talk. Today's experimental mathematics seminar speaker is Jotam Smilanski, who will talk about multi-scale substitution, substitution tilings. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Doron, for inviting me to speak at the seminar. And um, thanks everybody for showing up. So today's, today's talk is, I can't really say that it's really experimental mathematics. It, it mostly isn't, but there was a lot of experimenting on the way because the, the, the object that I'm, I want to describe to you and to introduce you to is something that me and my uh, co-author co and friend, uh, Yael Solomon, we came up and we were working on it for the previous, uh, actually for, for quite some time, for at least four years, uh, playing with it, changing definitions, finding, finding uh, the best way to define this new kind of object. And I think it's really fun. And I think it, uh, it connects to, to very um, interesting sides of math um, in dynamics, of course. This is, this is it's, it sits in the world of, um, of uh, dynamical systems, but of course in uh, metric geometry, because it's all about tilings and substitution has combinatorics all over it and multi-scales and scales has number theory in it. So it really, it's, uh, it sits in the kind of crossroad of many things. So let me start by just, you know, just straight on, this is what I'm talking about. This is a tiling, okay? So consider this as an example of a tiling of the entire plane. Uh, what is a tiling? It's a disjoint union of tiles that covers the entire Euclidean space. In this case, um, the you general- let me, let, me, let me interrupt for a second. Yesterday, uh, Roger Penrose, uh, was announced to get a Nobel Prize. Is that related to Penrose styling? Penrose? Well, this, yeah. this, well, Pe Penrose definitely didn't get his Nobel Prize for the Penrose stylings, yeah. but he should have because they're amazing. And I'm going to show an example. And uh, this, is, this is related in the sense that one can define Penrose stylings using a substitution rule. And these stylings that I show to you now are also defined using a substitution rule. But in fact, uh, in fact, there's a different flavor to things. So the Penrose tiling would be kind of a, an example of what we are not talking about in a sense. But I'll come to it, I'll come to it uh, in a bit. So, but again, as, as same with Penrose tilings, tilings are disjoint unions of tiles. In our work, tiles are just nice sets. Okay, in this case, all the tiles are either these down pointing triangles or up pointing triangles. Uh, they can be wilder. They can have, as long as we're talking about measurable, uh, measurable sets with um, bounded diameter and boundary of measure zero, that's more or less uh, enough for us. But we will focus because pictures are very nice when you focus on triangles and squares. So this talk would be about triangles and squares mostly. Okay, so how do these, how do these come about? So let me just start straightforward with, with constructing such tilings. And after I discuss the construction of the tilings, I'll discuss also uh, some results that we have obtained. So the basic object that you need to define such tilings is what I call multiscale substitution schemes. So a multiscale substitution scheme is essentially a pair and it consists of the following, the following two uh, parts. So first of all, you need prototiles. So prototiles are your basic objects, uh, basic objects that you define things on. These are your prototiles. Just normalize them to have unit volume and they are some nice sets in RD. And a substitution rule that defines a partition of each one of the prototiles into a disjoint union of rescaled copies of those prototiles. So in a sense, your prototiles are both the puzzles and the puzzle pieces that you are working to get, you, that you are building. So here's, I think examples will make this very clear. So the first simple example, everything here, most of the things I'll do here today will be in R2 because it's, this is, you know, I, iPad is immersed in R2. So here we have one prototype, just the unit square. 
And here we have a substitution rule defined on this unit square. And it gives us a new representation of the square as a disjoint union of 17 little squares. So 16 little squares and one medium square. Okay, so this is a, this is the sub, this is a graphic illustration of the substitution rule on the Souk square. And to your right, you can see a substitution a prototized up pointing triangle and down pointing triangle. And the substitution rule is illustrated in these pictures. So here you see, I have um, two over five. So this is the scale two fifths and one fifth. And here it's a half and a half. So why a half? Because this triangle has exactly half the side length of this, of the big one, right? So you see different scales, that's the word multi-scale. And the substitution is because you take a square and you substitute it with a union of squares. You take a triangle and you substitute it with a union of triangles or prototype and a union of rescaled copies of prototypes. So your term, is it like a, it's a, it's a fractal, right? This is not a fractal. This is, is not, not, this is not empty. Ah, okay. So, every, so everything here is full. You are right that you can define fractals in such a way. So how would one define a fractal? You would begin with this and you'd throw away all the white triangles and then replace all the red triangles by rescaled copies and throw away all the whites and rescale and, and do it uh, and take a, take a limit. So here you'd have like a fractal that is supported on this initial triangle and it would be a very nice object to study and people have been doing it. So there is a lot of literature uh, about these. It will be, I think it falls in the in this, uh, region of self-similar fractal strings or fractal sprays. There is a lot of uh, many names for different, uh, similar things. In the uh, work of mine that I, in, in, introduced uh, that I presented to you last year in the experimental mathematics seminar, I, I talked about multiscale substitution schemes and the sequences of partitions they define. And I gave you a little kind of a teaser to the no, tiling no, project. Sorry to interrupt, sorry to interrupt, that's panicked. Are, are you recording yourself? Um, somebody's some reason, re somebody's recording not, something. Robert did not show up, he was supposed to do it. No, the, it's it's it. I see a sign that that uh, things are recorded. I see a little oh, cloud. You're recording a little, it. Okay. I'm not recording anything, but oh, maybe it's automatic. Maybe. I hope so. Okay, sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In any case, this is not about uh, sequences of partitions, and this is not about fractals. It's about tilings. So it's a different. It's a different object. Tiling of the entire space. Okay. okay so this is the multiscale substitution scheme. Now. The Penrose tilings and similar substitution tilings, the standard construction is slightly slim simpler. You have a fixed single scale, uh, let's call it lambda, and you substitute everything according to the substitution rule. You substitute the prototype, and since everything appears with the same scale, you can rescale uniformly the entire patch back and get a bigger patch that is the union of the original prototypes not rescaled, just translation. So every iteration defines a larger and larger patch of the same original translated copies of the same original patch or same original tiles. And this can be studied in the following way. So first of all, how do you get tiling out of that? You can do it again and again and get bigger and bigger patches and take limit in a certain way that I will not go into to define substitution tilings of RD. These induce very nice Delaunay sets. Delaunay sets are sets that are not too dense and not too sparse. So since all the tilings are copies of the original prototypes, you can just put a, a point inside each one or take the vertex set if your tiles are polygons and you get a very nice Delaunay set, very nicely balanced point set. Have, you have a finite number of tiles up to translation because the scale is just, you know, you substitute and inflate, substitute and inflate, everything uh, is, is the same all the time. And you can control a lot of, of, of the construction and the information about those tilings using what is called a substitution matrix, which tells you 
how many tiles of each type appear in the substitution rule of each one of the prototiles. So this is an integer value, integer value uh, matrix. And using the Perron Frobenius theory, you can, you can know a lot about the dynamics and about statistics of these kind of uh, constructions. So let's get to Penrose. So Penrose, uh, he, didn't, he didn't come up with this con specific construction. Actually, Penrose didn't have a single tiling. Penrose tilings are a family of tilings. And this is one of the constructions of a member of a Penrose, the Penrose family of tilings. I think this is uh, sometimes called the Penrose Robinson tiling. I think Robinson uh, gave this representation using a substitution scheme. But here you see two prototiles, uh, blue or should be maybe tall triangle and, and small triangle. And the, all the tiles that appear in the substitution rule are rescaled copies of these original prototypes. So you always see exactly the same scale everywhere. This is one over the golden ratio. And indeed the substitution matrix here is just two, right? One and one, one has proborn Frobenius eigenvalue, which is just the square of the golden ratio. So things are related. So you study, you, you define the matrix and you can understand things about the inflation and the dynamics and the statistics. If you want to count in big patches, you have to take powers of these, of these, um, of these matrices and using the peron frobenius theory, you know what these powers converge to. So this is the standard and classical and very beautiful construction, which gives you this amazing tiling which is famous for being aperiodic. You have no period. You cannot translate it anywhere and get exactly the same thing again. But it has these illegal quasi-crystalline uh, rotation symmetries, these symmetries that are not allowed, essentially. So this is somehow, this predated Schechtman's discovery of quasi-crystals in the 80s. This is from the 70s. But it had this flavor of maybe we can have five-fold symmetry. Okay, so this is the, this is the classical standard, uh, very well understood construction. What did we set out to do? We set out to understand how, can, if, you, if one can define interesting examples by taking multiple scales, not a single scale. That's why we call it multi-scale substitution tilings. So clearly if we do this thing of substituting and inflating, if we have more than a single scale, then either it depends how much we have to choose what the inflating scaling is going to be, but either you're going to have very, very, very small tiles or you're going to have very, very, very big tiles. But in any case, you will definitely not get a Delonis set. And again, a Delonis set just means it's not too dense and it's not too sparse. It has, it's, it's uniformly discrete and relatively dense. Nicely, nicely, uh, uh, nicely spread, in a sense. Can I ask a question? This yes. Penrose tiling, this tiling that you're showing us, it has uh, a distinguished point. Is that correct? It has no, fivefold five specific... rotational symmetry. No. So what I've done, I've taken from one where the important point is, and I've just taken a batch out of it. I don't remember where exactly if it's it's if it's open. Uh, to the top of the of my screen or to the right, somewhere there is a point. It's not in the image. You don't see the central point. But no. in Penrose's okay. in Penrose's there construction, is, there is an important origin. The, there is a unique a unique yes. point, a distinguished point. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, that's a good point. So this, but uh, my talk is not is not about a periodic order at all. But this is kind of a patch from, not not a central patch. Okay. Thank you. So in order to, to go beyond this you know, problem of not getting nice tilings, we needed to find a new way to define, to define patches and tilings out of the multi-scale substitution scheme. So here is the idea that we suggest. So you position one of the prototiles so that the origin is in its interior. So you have the origin of your Euclidean space and you put that, your favorite triangle so that the origin is somewhere in the middle. And you define 
what we call the substitution flow, which we denote by ft, where t stands for time. So at time zero, you just look at your specific tile that you've started with. As time increases, you inflate, and whenever a tile surpasses uh, the unit volume, you apply the substitution rule on it and substitute it into a patch of smaller tiles. So at time zero, you are on the, your unit, unit volume, and you just inf start to inflate, and immediately you have to substitute it, and then you inflate and your tiles get bigger, and maybe some of them are very small, but maybe some of them are already close to unit volume. When they are unit volume, you substitute again and you continue. So this is a continuous thing, and you always see tiles in a specific um, segment of scales. So if this is what you see at time zero, so immediately after time zero, you substitute and you inflate until your biggest tile has reached volume one again, which is what happens at t equals log of five over two. Why is it log? Because the inflation is being done exponentially. So at e log five over two, this is just five halves. And notice that this tile, which is now the biggest one, was of scale two fifths. So two fifths times five halves is equal one. This is when it reaches the unit volume and substitute it again and again and again and again, and you keep inflating all the time. So you see that you have more and more, I mean, in this specific case, what you'll, what you'll see is that as time grows, you'll see more and more substitutions. They will become denser and denser and denser. And you can think of it in the limit as a continuous thing. Okay. This is each picture here a subset of the next picture? Are they nested? No, no, these are not nested. Okay. They contain nested. Uh, we will talk about nested in a second. These, these, so initially these are not nested at all. You have a continuous family of patches that exhaust the entire space. And the way to take limits out of them, you have to do it uh, with respect to a specific topology. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is, this is the procedure. You flow by expanding and wherever you need, you substitute. Whenever something reaches the critical benchmark volume, you substitute it. So how do you get tilings out of this? Our tilings are defined as the limits, oops, the limits of translation of these patches that come from the flow with respect to what is called the Chaboti Feld topology. It has many different names, but I think these are the most standard ones in metric geometry and uh, metric group theory, Chaboti Feld topology, which is defined on the space of closed subsets of RD. So we can identify a patch with a closed subset of RD. We look at the space, this huge space of all, uh, all, all closed subsets of RD, and the following, the following topology can be defined using this metric. This metric, given the, I'm giving you the formula here, which is not so nice to read, but essentially what does it say? It says, sets are close. If restricting to a very large centered ball, each is contained in a small neighborhood of the other. So you look at a very big ball and you see that you look at the neighborhood of each one of the sets, it's contained in so, so each set is contained in the neighborhood of the other. So A1 is contained in a little neighborhood of A2, and A2 is contained in a little neighborhood of A1, where we look at a very big ball. Think of R as, as, as something small, okay? So this defines a metric, and it's related, of course, to the Hausdorff metric. So it's the Hausdorff metric restricted on, on balls which makes the whole space a compact space, okay? So this gives you a compact space and the tiling space, which consists of all such limits, the tiling space with respect to our substitution scheme sigma, which consists of all the tilings that are generated by the substitution scheme sigma and the substitution flow as we define it, is a compact space, subspace of the closed, uh, of closed sets. 
Okay, so we have not only a tiling, uh, not only a tiling of R D, we have in fact a space of tilings of R D. So this is this is essentially the construction, and you understand these limits. And this is this is an example. Okay, this is a patch from an example. This time with squares. What is our problem now is that we have a very nice construction, but it's somewhat uh, vague, right? Because you think about limits in this uh, slightly hard to work with uh, topology, which is not very friendly maybe. If one just wants to construct nice pictures, this is not the best way to go. So we suggest the following procedure. We can define what is called stationary timings. So how does one, how does one uh, just constructs them with, their, with just with the bare hands. You can always, if you position your prototype in a certain way around the origin, there is a time that you inflate and substitute according to the flow where you see again your initial prototype in exactly the same place. And you get, some, you get a nested, you get the first prototype nested in a bigger patch. Under very uh, simple assumptions that will always hold in our construction, this is possible. So you have a you have a you have a initial positioning of your tile, and you have some time that if you flow for that time long that uh, you flow that time, you get again the same prototype in the same place. It follows that if you do it again for s time for time s, you get another patch, and both of the first patches are subsets of that. And so you can, you can continue in this way for every, for every K and define a tiling as the union of this of these uh, nested, uh, nested sequence. So this is a limit. You don't translate every, anything anywhere. So it's a much simpler construction and you can really do it by your hands because you just, you just put it there and then you know how it's going to look because everything is nested. So it satisfies this uh, also very useful equation that you take the entire tiling and you apply the flow S time, you get the tiling again. So here is the example with the square scheme. Here S would be, we position, so we position the square around the origin. And remember that there were two scales, there were the fifth and the three fifths. And the, the interior square was the one that corresponded to the three fifths. So if we, if we inflate it by five, uh, five over three, we get a unit square. So in fact, we get by, sub, by expanding it by five over three, we get this patch that has the initial unit square inside. And we do it again and again and again and again. And now this is a nested sequence of sets, okay? So this is a nested sequence of sets. This is the construction that uh, a year ago I, I showed this, uh, this seminar of getting a nested sequence of, of sets. You can always do that. And then you can, uh, then you can define and really touch with your hands uh, multi-scale substitution timing. So this is not some vague construction. You can really, really build them. And one of the nicest results that we have is that in fact, every element of the space can be approached as the limit of translations of a given, a given uh, tiling. So this is a minimality of the dynamical system. By translating, here it would be in R2, every such, sub every such multi scale substitution tiling is in fact the limit of translation of this stationary one, okay? So, it's a, not only a nice construction, this stationary uh, construction, but it also is very useful because you can do a lot of your calculations on these simple uh, examples and then, and then uh, they will imply things for the entire space. Okay. Um, maybe I can, maybe, are there any questions? I mean, this is the construction and the rest will be kind of more about uh, more about the results and so on. I have a question. Yes. What, you, you just said that you, this gives you anything. This is, if you have just one tiling, one tile in your set, right? This doesn't mm -hmm. apply if there are more than, more than one uh, prototypes. No, you can have any, any, any amount of prototypes. 
But here you only have one. Yes. Yes, okay. We have one, but of course, all the pictures that I've showed before, shown before, for example, the first one with uh, this is just a chunk out of stationary tiling. Uh -huh. The only pictures that I can do are chunks out of stationary tilings. But this is a chunk, and I've done, you know, I made this huge, huge, huge image, and I just show you now a little piece of it, and you don't know where you are at all, right? You, you don't see the center. Yes. It's not clear what's going on. But essentially, the minimality says that this is how it looks locally. Hmm. Um, yes, and I, I'll say something about this in a minute. Thank you. So, when when last year uh, when last year I uh, talked about something related to related construction in the seminar, um, I was asked by by Professor Sloan about coordination sequences. So this was one of the nicest things that happened just a couple of days after I got to Rutgers. It was on my first day in the university. I gave this talk and I was asked about coordination sequences. I have no answer about coordination sequences, but uh, I, was, I was really uh, thrilled about the following graphics. So what is a coordination sequence? Essentially, in this case, the sequence counts the number of tiles of distance n from the center. So here there is some important center point. And as you can see, the number, okay, so one is all, it's always the zeroth, the zeroth element. But if you want to go up, if you can see this, there are three neighbors here, three neighbors here, three neighbors here, and three neighbors here. So this is the 12. And the next, the neighbors of the neighbors, we have 16 and so on. And when, when, uh, when I did some computations and I've sent this uh, to Professor Sloan and he put it on the uh, OEIS, the Online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. So it's, I have a sequence there and I'm really proud of that. And then uh, Mr. Lars Blomberg came, out, came along and did this amazing thing. Just continued to do, he continued to uh, understand 500 elements of this sequence which I, I could go up to 15. And he made these beautiful images. And what you can see here, this is kind of a generation 12 of a stationary tiling. So you can see tiles are, are essentially so tiny, you can't see really anything. And these are kind of the energy levels of, of this sequence. And does this converge to anything? Does it converge to a, to a diamond? Or maybe it becomes circles? I don't know. <laughs> but but I think this is lovely, and we can really see. So this is for the sixth generation, and this is for the twelfth generation. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Well, thanks <laughs> to you. I, I I didn't know about coordination sequences before, and I still have no answers. But it it's just some more nice questions to ask. Yeah. Okay. So this is the construction. Now, there is a very useful model for, under, for working with substitution schemes. If you would need for the standard construction, you'd need a matrices, those uh, substitution matrices, this will not be enough now because you have to take into consideration also the scales, not only the combinatorical uh, information. So we introduced the graph model. So essentially we associate to every scheme a directed weighted graph, every tile, every prototile is a vertex. So this is the up and this is the down. And every tile that appears somewhere in the substitution uh, rule is an edge. Um, and its weight, essentially the weight of the edge or the length of the edge comes from the scale. So you see this one would be two fifths so it corresponds to the self loop of log five over two. And here, this is one, this is the half, and this is another half. So you have three whites. So these are three self loops of log two and one edge going to the other direction of the same length log two corresponding to this tile. You don't really model the geometry, but you model somehow the information, the statistical information and understanding, if you want to understand statistics of 
the tilings, you must understand statistics and distribution of, um, of paths on these weighted graphs. There are two basic cases of multi-scale substitution tilings. The, the one that I'm interested in is called the incommensurable scheme. What is incommensurability? It essentially can, it can be defined in many ways, but the simplest way to define it is to say that the scheme is incommensurable if its associated graph contains two closed paths of lengths which are incommensurable, ratio of which is irrational. And otherwise it would be commensurable and a scheme is irreducible if it is strongly connected, the graph. So this is very standard to assume irreducibility and this incommensurability is the new ingredient. So let's look at some examples. Our Peron, Penrose uh, Robinson example from before, all the scales were the same size. So all the edges are of the same length. So all paths are of integer time this length and all the ratios turn out to be all those logs, log fees, they just cancel and you just get rational numbers. So this, this construction is commensurable. There is, no, there is no irrationality in it. It's just a rational construction. This beautiful example that is known as the Rossi scheme, you take this weird fractal boundary set and you divide it into three copies of itself. Here, the scale would be tau, tau squared, and tau cubed, where tau is a root of some nice cubic, um, the, sometimes called the Tribonacci uh, polynomial, the Tribonacci, yeah, Tribonacci constant. So here again, everything is just, because it's the same tau, tau squared, tau, uh, tau cubed, then their logs are integer times log tau, integer times log tau, integer line, log times log tau, and all the paths are like this, and all the ratios are rational. On the other hand, in the so-called alpha Kakutani scheme, where you take the unit interval here and you divide it into two intervals, one of them is alpha times i and the other one is one minus alpha times i, for almost every alpha you are incommensurable. So you are essentially, um, essentially incommensurability is a generic, is a generic property it holds for our squares, it holds for the triangle that I've been showing you. And um, the commensurable examples are beautiful, they're well studied, they have uh, very special properties, but they're not our focus. We will focus on the incommensurable uh, construction. And there is a good reason for that. Just an answer to the question, do we even generate anything new? So as long as we assume incommensurability, Yes, these are, these are definitely not classical substitution timings. They cannot be constructed. They're not just a new representation of the same thing, while commensurable uh, multiscale substitution timings used with the same flow can be also always generated using the standard procedure. Maybe you will need a different uh, set of prototypes. Maybe you'll need some different rules, but you can also always, given a commensurable scheme, always define a new substitution scheme and just define it using those iterations classical way with one fixed scale. So you can think about the commensurable uh, tilings or schemes as the rationals and the incommensurable tilings as the irrationals. This is kind of the, it's not a generalization, right? The irrationals are not a general, generalization of the rationals, they're the complement. So our result do not hold for the Penrose tiling. Well, they hold, most of them hold for the Penrose dialing because many people did great work before us, but our result as they are cannot be applied to the Penrose dialing. Okay, so we assume for this reason exactly, we assume from now on that all schemes are both irreducible and incommensurable. Irreducible is just a technical thing because if, it, if, it, if a scheme is not irreducible, then you can just throw to the bin some, some of the prototypes and you'll be okay, nothing will happen. In commensurability, this is the crucial part. This is, this is our new ingredient here, this irrationality that we put into this construction of substitution patterns. Okay, um, any, any questions? I've been, I've been speaking rather quickly.
but I haven't been saying very deep things because there are no results yet, only a construction. So if anybody has a question about the second slide, uh, that's, that makes sense. Incommensurable, this is a new thing, the incommensurable tilings. It's a yes. new? Yes. So that's a novelty. Yes. That's a novelty. People were playing around with specific examples. There are some, um, there were some attempts also re quite recently in the, last, in the last few years, but people have been playing around with the idea of having this irrationality between, uh, irrationality relations between uh, scales and between tiles. But uh, all the examples that I know of were either essentially those, what I call this alpha kakutani, where you have alpha units and times the one minus alpha and unit interval, um, which is related to a construction that uh, Kakutani was working on in the 70s, or a generalization by Lorenzo Sadun of the very famous pinwheel tiling. So he played about with the construction of the famous pinwheel tiling of Conway and Radin, and and made the construction which is incommensurable. But again, uh, there was no general theory and both of the, all the construction that, that were looked at were looked at specifically for that specific scheme and they all had only one prototype. So their graphs were, would have been like this if they would have defined the graph. There was no kind of richer uh, construction. Thank you. Yes, and uh, yeah, but as we continue with this project, we find more and more people were thinking maybe to do something like this. I mean, people keep sending me their papers, uh, but so far, so far, I was not, I did not have to go to the archive and, and get mine off, so I'm happy. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is um, another blow up of a, of, a, of a tiling, this time with uh, two different triangles and some orientations also. So let me briefly, and not I would not go into depth, just uh, discuss some of our results. So essentially the paper and our project, which is ongoing, but the first paper was just the construction and then a bunch of theorems that we prove. Um, mostly kind of the basic first question that you would ask in different fields when you look, about, you look at tilings. So the first structural theorem is existence which we have proved, right? Because we just build them one with their own hand. A scheme generates a tiling space. So that's fine. There is, we are not talking about an empty uh, concept. This tiling space is invariant under translations in RD. Translation means just you move everything around. And is also invariant under the flow, meaning you, you expand and, and you inflate and substitute. So these two actions have this very nice relationship. If you first translate and then inflate is like first inflating and then translating by maybe, some, by maybe something more, you have to a bit expand. And this is reminiscent of the horospheric and geodesic actions in homogeneous dynamics. So this is, or in hyperbolic dynamics actually. So this is, this, this is useful and in fact, this is kind of a hint to say, this is very recent stuff that, uh, that um, was uh, suggested to us by someone who, who, who came to one of my talks. And he suggested that perhaps everything we see is some kind of a shadow of a hyperbolic thing. Perhaps we are only looking at sections of tilings in a hyperbolic space. But so far, I think I believe the, this idea, but it's not, uh, I don't, I don't want to say anything more about it yet, but in any case, you do have this very nice relation between horospheric and geodesics. Geodesics, our inflation, has periodic orbits. They correspond to our stationary tilings. So if you begin with a tiling and then you inflate by S and get the same tiling, this is a closed orbit. You get, again, the same thing. And these closed orbits, they can be modeled as closed orbits of flow on our graph. Again, hyperbolic dynamics, this is related to uh, a lot of work in hyperbolic dynamics and in dynamical zeta function and in the famous work of Parry and Polycott about the, um, the 
how the, the prime orbit theorem of, dynamic, of, hyperbo of hyperbolic uh, dynamics, which a simple case of it may be defined using flows on graphs. So if we want to know the statistics, the number of distinct periodic orbits of length at most something, this behaves just like prime numbers. The same, the same techniques work for the prime number theorem for integers and for the prime orbit theorem. It's, it's a beautiful theory. It's really a beautiful thing that somehow both of these things come up and you really need the incommensurability here. This is not true in general. This is, you need the incommensurability in this construction. Did you say the, the prime orbit theorem, who yes. is that due to? Is uh, that your theorem? No, 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 no. This is, this is theory of Parry and polygons. Well, I think that some of it started with Margulis, but Parry and Polycott beginning from the beginning of the 80s and into the 90s, and, and Mark Polycott is still expanding this theory to other uh, regimes, but um, this is a very rich uh, theory. Polycott? Yeah, hmm. Polycott from, from Warwick. Yeah. Thank you. Tidings have a hierarchical structure. This is very, very useful. This is often called super tiles. What is super tiles? You, you, you somehow put some tiles together to, to define a new tile, super tile. I don't want to go into it, but in this construction here, our original tiles are the first, are there zero order tiles, super tiles. This would be a first order super tile. The entire thing, whoa, this is a second order super tile. So this is very useful because Using super tiles, we can, we can do a lot of computations on super tiles. And then if we want to study more general sets, we can, we can approximate them using super tiles. So we can translate, we can do simple computations and translate them using this hierarchy into, into uh, more general results. So these are some structural uh, theorems. Um, these, this is about the graph and the way that the graph behaves with respect to the substitution flow. Essentially, if you want to understand the flow of the styling space, you have to understand the flow on the graph. You start at a vertex, and every time you pass at a vertex, you split to all the outgoing edges, and that's like splitting the prototype into tiles. And then you continue to flow with time, and whenever you, you touch another vertex, fuck, again, you, in your own time, you have to uh, be substituted and so on. And this distribution of those, of those flows on the graph, it models exactly the, the distribution of the substitution flow, the distribution of tiles. Because there is a very useful uh, analogy between a point on a graph and the scale and the type of a given tile. So this is, this is, this is not something that one can just immediately uh, maybe grasp, at least I, I, it, it took me a long time but the idea is this, at time zero, nothing happened. You have your one prototype. Immediately after you start running the clock, then you set out in both directions. You set out here and you set out here. When you set out to this side, when, when you hit your vertex back, this means that, you are, that your associated tile has reached the volume one. It's ready to be substituted. This one has not reached its vertex. It's not, it has not reached volume one. It is not ready, it's not cooked. You see, it's too small. Maybe next time, who knows? And then you continue. So this would be going twice here. This would be going, this, this one would be twice choosing the third. Not, I mean, one time choosing the third and not re being ready to substitute it. And this one, is first going to the two-third direction and then going to the third direction. So this is very hand-waving, the way to understand the substitution flow and the, and the graph and, and the flow in the graph. Okay, but this is again, I'm, I'm sorry, this maybe the slide is a bit uh, weird. Just to say some things about geometrical and statistical results. A very nice basic thing is that our limit tilings, even though they might be thought of as weird, in fact, all tiles in those tilings are just similar to rescaled uh, copies of the prototypes. It's not that you get 
if you start with a square, you don't suddenly get some, some, some other things, some trapezoid. You always get squares in the limit. So this is, this is nice because then you have a type, you really have a type of tile. And there's like finitely many types, same number as the prototypes. Tiles do, are no longer appearing always in the same scale as in the classical uh, theory. In fact, they appear in a dense set of scales. This is exactly the incommensurability. It means you keep on mixing, mixing your scales and you get a dense thing. So this is, this is a new thing, dense set of scales. But since this dense set of scales, they sit inside some interval of possible scales, then we have a nice Delaunay set if we put a point in each, in each time. It's, it's nicely spread. It's not too nicely spread. So it's nicely spread in the sense of Delaunay sets, but it's not uniformly spread in the sense of being, of having a bounded displacement bijection to, a, to, a, to some um, lattice. So a set, a point that is called uniformly spread, if there exists a bijection from your point set to some lattice, so that the supremum of your displacement is bounded. You are not, you are not uh, sent too far away. And these tilings are not uniformly spread. So these are not lattice-like. Penrose tiling is uniformly spread. So this is another difference. Whenever you have incommensurability, you are never uniformly spread. There are some nice little ideas that you can think about if you start to play, play a bit with your scale. So if you take a stationary construction, you can define a complexity function, meaning that in each generation, how many scales do you see? So SSCK is the number of scales you see in generation K. And you can ask, does this sequence, uh, does this sequence stabilize at some point? Does it have to, to always be strictly growing, what happens? So one result is that when, if it stabilizes, it must stabilize completely. And in that case, we are in the commensurable case. So if you are in the incommensurable case, you are always having more and more and more and more scales. This is clear, but you can really control it and, and find what we call stru Sturmian tidings, which resemble Sturmian words in symbolic, uh, symbolic dynamics, in which you are growing in the minimal way, each time by one. So this square example is an example where you grow as slowly as possible. So this is something that, that one can play with and, and kind of find nice little examples, which is, which is some fun. <clears throat> the, maybe, maybe I'll take these two together. One of the last things I want to, to tell you is about explicit counting formulas. I'm not going to, there's, a, there's too many letters and too many words and too many, I know that this, this slide is, is just a bit too much, but here is the idea. If you want to understand the number of tiles of a given type in a big, big patch, you can evaluate it using information that is either combinatoric comes from a substitution matrix or the weighted substitution matrix, which also has the scales inside it, or the entropy matrix, which tells you information about the entropy of partition given by the substitution uh, rule. So these information, this combinatorial, rescaling, and entropy information allow you to really have natural, uh, natural formulas for the number of tiles of a given type inside a very big patch, or the volume of tiles of such type in a very big patch, and any other combination of, of these type of formulas. So the idea here is that for some, for some magical reason, there, and these things are not in the paper, these, these are uh, newer, you can really have beautiful, clear, really, if you, if you have a look at it for five minutes, it's crystal clear of the, here is the combinatorial information, here is the scale information, here is the entropy. This W is just an eigen, it, it's just an eigen, eigen vector of the weighted substitution matrix. 
everything here can be really spelled out just by looking at the very, very basic information that one can read off the initial substitution rule. And in specific examples, this is very easy. Those matrices, their, their size is the number of prototypes. So in the squared case, all these matrices are one by one matrices. And in the triangles, it's two by two matrices. This is really something that is very easy to just write down and do these computations. So this is, this is kind of magic. And an extension of this magic is being able to give a density. The number of tiles of type R that are in a specific scale between some interval of scales is given by integrating this function that again is very, very simple to understand. It's everything can be fit into a half of a slide, which is kind of special. So using these densities, you can really understand everything you want to know about the statistics of tiles, which is very rich. So of course, not only they appear in dense in a dense uh, interval of scales, but you can really, really touch them, touch the, touch the distribution. And if you're only interested in one dimensional constructions, and instead of tiles, you think of their boundaries and you get these point sets, then you know everything you want to know about the gap distribution. So this is kind of an important uh, correlation that one studies when one looks at, uh, at point processes, for example. I don't know how, to, uh, I, I can't say a lot about pair correlations, but definitely about gap distributions, this gives the entire, entire theory. And using this result, one can show uniform patch frequencies. So not only tiles appear with these nice relative frequencies, every patch that you see, every you take two triangles and then one triangle above it, if you rescale a bit, you allow a bit of rescaling, you know exactly the frequencies of appearances along every tiling in your tiling space. So this is uniform patch frequencies. And I will skip those remarks and just say that using those uniform patch frequencies, we have our most important result, the tiling dynamical system with respect to the RD action of translations is uniquely ergodic. There exists a unique ergodic RD invariant probability measure on this space, which is kind of a proof of, um, you know, that this is a model that is worth studying. And what we're doing now is understanding more about the dynamics, about mixing and more about this unique, unique uh, ergodic invariant measure. And I know my time's up and I know we are very strict here. So <laughs> thank you. Are there any quick questions for your time from the audience? Anyway, there was really a, a lot of progress since last time. So uh, it looks like you're making this yes. progress. Yes, so, yes. And so I, I, you mentioned the OIS, so this exact counting at the end, does this may lead to integer thicknesses or it's uh, more continuous? The switch counting? The last, uh, the last slide that you said you, you can do the counting. If, if, if it's not Sturmian, you, you'll get some sequence. Uh, this one. Which isn't, isn't Sturmian. Ah. Are those, have you looked at them? No, but I think this is a very special uh, case. I think the, the minute that you have more than two scales playing, then you have to grow faster than Sturmian. Yes. But I do not know anything about, I mean, I haven't, it's, it's, it's just one of those questions that we have to continue thinking about. Does, is it linear? Is it, what is it? Can it be exponential? I don't know. Uh -huh. is it I guess it's, it has to be, I, I, my feeling is that it has to be, uh, um, I don't know, this is, this is definitely linear, right? This is just uh, k plus one. Huh. Uh, my feeling that it, is it can't grow too fast, but maybe, I, maybe I'm miscalculating. Yeah, no. Well, but, you're in two dimensions, so it can't maybe grow too fast. Yeah. I really am not sure. So, so the thing about this project that as, as maybe, it, it's very eclectic. And there are so many things that I'm not sure about. Actually, I'm not sure about most things. This is kind of the first step in a few different directions that people often ask about tilings. And we just, okay, we can answer this question and this question, this question, this question, and 
let's you know let's get it out and let's you know let's see what's going to happen next i really don't know another question is a little bit reminiscent of new sloan's a uh, french windows do you try to put colors into these nice pictures and make it into art well here is one attempt is the <laughs> <laughs> it's not very pretty. No, I haven't really done anything um, artistic about it. I just, these things are done not by computer. I mean, it's done in a computer, but it's done using um, a designer software. So I did not compute this. I did copy paste and then colored with my hand. So whenever I finished something, I just finished with it because it's a lot of work, but maybe, maybe I should. I'm actually, actually, I like, my favorites are the, are the black and white. I think they have, um, they have something about them. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for a great talk. This ends this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you all next week. Thank you.